Hi, I'm Conan O'Brien. Welcome to Serious Jibber Jabber. Peter Goralnik is one of America's preeminent music writers and historians. His two books on Elvis Presley are recognized as the gold standard of music biographies and have been praised for stripping away the myth and focusing on Elvis the musician. His other work includes an equally acclaimed biography of Sam Cooke entitled Dream Boogie, and he's currently putting the finishing touches on the life story of Sun Records owner Sam Phillips. This is stuff I really love to talk about, so Peter Goralnik, thank you for indulging me and in being here. <laughs> well, thank you, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, let's uh, begin by mentioning that you were on my late night show uh, uh, and we were chatting and I had such a good time talking to you that I thought we must continue this conversation. That was 19 years ago. It takes me a while to get to things, but thanks for finally making this happen. Well, it's, it's good to be able to have that, uh, you know, the sequel. Yeah, this is the take sequel. Yeah. This is the sequel. And we have a little more time now and I'm a little more experienced. Uh, let's get right into it. Um, I am a, a, a big Elvis Presley fan and had read just about every book, I thought, on Elvis, and then your two volumes came along uh, and completely reorganized my thinking about Elvis and changed everything. And I think the biggest contribution of those books, uh, especially the first book, is that you, you stripped away all the layers of myth and all the iconography and all of these sort of ironic joking about Mm -hmm. Elvis, and you got back to this kid, this incredible kid, this 19-year-old uh, with an amazing talent who changes the world. Right. What inspired you to do that? Well, you know, that was, I mean, the intention really was to go back to a time when you didn't know how it was all going to come out. And the funny thing is the two things that inspired it uh, were, one, I was uh, driving down Macklemore Avenue where, um, in South Memphis. Uh, where Stax Records uh, was and where the Stax Museum is now. And I was driving down with a friend who had grown up in South Memphis, and she pointed out right across the street from the old movie theater that was Stax, a boarded-up drugstore where Elvis's cousin, Jean, Jean, used to work. This is way back before I even thought about the book. And she just described how Elvis would be in there waiting for Jean to get off work, and she said, you know, he'd be sitting at the counter and his fingers would just be drumming, you know, he was just so, he was hyperactive, and she said, and then she just said, poor baby. And I just had this flash of inspiration. I mean, this was a kid, this is a kid, as you said, he was just consumed with music. I mean, any kid who was into music, or in a sense, who's consumed with anything like that should be able to understand it. He was just absolutely, and, but, but he was also just a kid who had dreams, but had no, you know, had no, means of achieving them. And that was the kid that I really wanted to, to get back to. The other thing, and this was almost an equal revelation for me, was I, I worked, I started working on this documentary about Elvis. And this was at a time, you know, pre-internet when the, all the interviews that Elvis did, I mean, I just didn't, wasn't aware of them. They were not accessible. And the documentarians, the two people who were making the thing, got together all these interviews he had done in 55 and 56, and suddenly it struck me as, oh my God, Elvis can speak for himself. And that was really the intention of the book, was to have him speak for himself and to write a book that was written, I mean, this is what I've tried to do with everything I've ever written, to write a book that was written from the inside out, that wasn't just looking at some mythic thing or, oh, look, this guy came down from another planet. Right. It basically was trying to understand the world that he was looking at and how he responded to it. Well, uh, I got the opportunity, the honor to, to interview David Halberstam um, a number of years before he passed away. And he had written a book about the fifth, called The Fifties. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, what do you think was the most significant event in the fifties? And we're talking about, uh, you know, you've got everything. You've got the Korean War and uh, you've got uh, McCarthy and you've got all these huge seminal events. And I said, and, and civil rights and everything. I said, what was the biggest thing? And he said, Elvis. Elvis was the event that uh, was the most explosive, I even including the hydrogen bomb. He said, more than the <laughs> hydrogen bomb, Elvis Presley. Right. Do you agree with that? You know, I don't know how you compare things like that. I, I think that Elvis was a focal point. And, and, and I mean, and in, in, in fact, on some level, I don't know that Elvis would agree with that. Because what I think that Elvis, Elvis saw, Elvis was, 
he was like an ethnomusicologist without a degree. I mean, you could not have met anyone who knew more about music of every kind of music. He listened to the Metropolitan Opera. He would go to the uh, all-night uh, singings at uh, Ellis Auditorium, which was across the street from the public housing where he grew up. And they really weren't all night, but these were the, the gospel quartet singings. He knew everything about white gospel music. He knew everything about black gospel music. He just soaked everything up, you know, uh, like litmus paper. But he, uh, it's, I, I would say, more so than Elvis, that the 20th century really witnessed the triumph of American vernacular culture. And that Elvis was part of a movement, he was part of a continuum. And you could include Duke Ellington, you could include, you could include Louis Armstrong, you could include Hank Williams, Howlin' Wolf, Bo Diddley. And for Elvis, I think he saw, he just had the widest scope imaginable. And this encompassed every major social, racial, cultural development. And it also went on, in a sense, I think, the entire movement to, to create as great a cultural contribution as America has ever made to the world. It, it, won, it won over the world. So it extends beyond, it extends beyond our borders. And I, I think that, that, for me, is what it is. But no, Elvis, there's no limit, in a sense, to what you can put into Elvis' achievement, whether intended or not. I mean, it touched every aspect of our lives. I, when I was in college, um, and it's the 80s, and I had sort of come of age with 60s and 70s music, and uh, Elvis wasn't a big interest of mine. And then, I wanna say 1983, I listened for the first time to the Sun Sessions, uh, Elvis's earliest work that he did with Sam Phillips, mm -hmm. and it blew my mind. It just, I couldn't, it was like a drug. I couldn't get enough of it. It made me go out and buy a guitar. It made me try and play that music. And in a sense, I've never gotten past that music. I can't get past early Elvis. I can't get past Jerry Lee Lewis. I can't get past Carl Perkins. I appreciate the other music, but I'm always drawn back. It's just this energy because it, it's coming out of the initial explosion of all the, I don't know, you'd know, understand better than I would, but all the socioeconomic events are there. All the cultural events are there. And then in Memphis, this thing happened. Yeah, no, it's the confluence of all these influences, the confluences of all these different cultures. I mean, Memphis was just at the heart of everything. And when you think about Sam Phillips, who recorded the, all of these uh, artists to begin with, and recorded B.B. King, recorded Howlin' Wolf, recorded Ike Turner, recorded just Dr. Yeah. Ross, uh, you know, the one-man band, Little Junior Parker. But what, what it brought together, I mean, in a sense, it was, it was a plot to undermine the sense of separateness that dominated American culture. And it was very much what Sam Phillips envisioned from the moment that he first opened a studio on January 2nd, 1950, that he made that declaration to begin with. And if you listen, it's an amazing thing. You listen to B.B. King's first recordings that he made for, for Sam Phillips, or you listen to Howlin' Wolf. And what Sam was aiming for was rock and roll without there being any title to it. It was just a combination of all these different influences and this rhythmic drive. And it was a, a sense of exuberance. I think that, that more than anything else. And you get that sometimes. I mean, I really dug the band that was on your show tonight. Yeah. But, but I mean, the point is that so often, uh, you know, music can take on a kind of affectation, I mean, an, 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 of attitude or whatever. Well, rock and roll is continue. It's, it's always, uh, it, it, it becomes, laden with all this stuff, which can be great, but mm -hmm. rock and roll is constantly drifting or pop music is constantly drifting away and you're getting orchestras and you're getting, you know, um, people are auto-tuned and then it gets stripped away and people bring it back. Punk was all about saying, let's reclaim this. Mm -hmm. Let's reclaim this. Uh, rock and roll is not for really gifted musicians in sticks or rush. It's for people like us who only play two or three chords, but we have this feeling that we need to express. Well, yeah, I mean, Sam, Sam spoke about giving voice to those who didn't have voice, and he also spoke, uh, in a sense, just about, about this uh, sense of perfect imperfection. 
Right. The perfection is boring, but what you wanted was the perfect realization of this imperfect striving. Now, the, 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 what, what's so interesting, I mean, I, I think I had so, you know, very much the same experience with Elvis that you did in the sense of what brought me to Elvis was the blues. I mean, I just fell into the blues when I was 15 or, right. uh, 15 or 16, and I just, I mean, I never turned back. And it was, I hadn't heard the Sun recordings until after that. I mean, I had heard Elvis's popular recordings, but uh, when he was in the Army in 59 or 60, uh, L RCA had no product to put out, and they put out two albums. Uh, that it contained most of the Sun recordings. And right. I recognized them. I recognized That's All Right. I knew Arthur Crudup's That's right. All Right. I recognized Mystery Train. I mean, I knew Little Junior Parker's. And it wasn't that Elvis's versions replaced that, but it was so pure and it was so out of time. And that's what I think is so interesting about his early music or Jerry Lee Lewis's early music, is if you didn't know it was rock and roll, you'd be hard pressed to find a name for it. Right. Because it's so much itself. You listen to that. That's All Right or Mystery Train, and you just listen to that trio recording, just his Elvis's acoustic guitar, Scotty Moore's electric guitar, the slapping bass. And what does that have to do with rock and roll as it's defined? And right. very little. I mean, it, it just, it's just, it's, it's its own self. And that, I think, is what's absolutely, that's what's enabled it to continue to have a life of its own. It's what's so extraordinary about it is that it lives outside of, it's not, it's not running after a trend, it's not, it's just creating its own sound. Let's step back and, and create this moment because you have Sam Phillips. Sam Phillips is a very unusual guy. Um, he's kind of manic. He's very gifted. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but he has a, this kind of drive, this, this drive to uh, bring black, white music together and get rid of the, the racial barrier. Mm -hmm. He sets up his own studio, Sun, Sun Studios. Mm -hmm. He knows Scotty Moore. Scotty Moore knows Bill Black. So he's got these musicians. Now the great fable is that Elvis just wanders in off the street, he's a truck driver for Crown Electric, and magic happens. That's the movie version. Right. What I was struck by when I read your books is I realized Elvis kept coming back. He went to Sun Studios many times, mm -hmm. recorded, it didn't click. He would sing ballads, he would try things, he would hang around, and it was only when Scotty Moore is looking for a singer and and that that and, and Sam Phillips says, well, let's try that kid mm -hmm. again. And he comes by, and, and even that session almost didn't work. They're trying and trying and trying. It doesn't work. And then Elvis is goofing around, and he just starts to play That's All Right, Mama. Right. And that's right. when the whole thing happened. Right, right. So it, to me, it always felt like it wasn't an accident. Elvis somehow knew he had something, and he kept coming back. He's like a salmon swimming upstream. He probably doesn't even know why he's doing it, but he just <laughs> kept coming to Sun Studios because he, if you have that kind of talent on some subconscious level, you must know it. Well, I, yeah, I mean, Elvis was this guy who had played, had not played out in public in any way, shape, or form. Right. He's a guy who practiced in front of the mirror. He's like a kid, you know, practicing air guitar. I mean, he got a guitar, and he did. There were other kids in, the, uh, in Lauderdale courts who, were more accomplished, and he hung around with them to some extent. But he didn't play with a band. He didn't. Right. And he, uh, but but what he did have was he had an innate belief in himself. For all of his insecurity, he believed in an almost mystical way. Both he and his mother had a vision very early in in his life of his achieving a kind of success that neither one of them could have named, neither one of them could, could have right. altogether pictured. And I don't, he, I don't think he ever had a doubt that he was going to get there, but where, where there was was not, was not exactly clear. He now, couldn't know, yeah. And he put himself in the way of discovery. It's almost like a guy who uses his shyness to make a hit with girls. He just kind of you know, hangs around. He, he uses his vulnerability uh, right. to draw attention to himself. And Elvis went in there. He cut that first record. I mean, actually, if you hear the acetate, which miraculously survived, if you listen to My Happiness and That's When Your mm -hmm. Heartaches Begin, you hear all the vulnerability. I mean, you can barely play the guitar, right. but you hear all the vulnerability. You hear all of the feeling. You, it's such an unusual thing. You don't have, it's not a trained voice, it's some, but it's something that, that communicates better than so, than so many trained voices, than so many of the artists that... Elvis admired because they were such great singers, better singers than Elvis. But even in that first thing at 19 or 18, actually, he was able to get that. And then he right, he kept coming back and coming back, just to he he um, 
struck up a friendship with Marion Keisker. I mean, like so many women, Marion Keisker, who was Sam Phillips' assistant, just she was the assistant who sort of was the gatekeeper at right. Sun. And she just, you know, she fell in love with him. Yeah. I mean, in in and and I think she uh, helped advance his cause with Sam, and then eventually. Uh, Scotty Moore uh, was, and Bill Black were in a band, and as you say, uh, Scotty was looking for a singer who could who yeah. could who could travel. Everybody else, everybody had a day job, and yeah. nobody else was going to travel. And and uh, so they brought uh, so Elvis uh, Elvis uh, had a rehearsal with Scotty at his house, went into the studio, and sang nothing but ballads. Yeah. And they're beautiful ballads, but yeah. nothing even remotely like the what he... The thing that blew me away is that the people, uh, you know, uh, the people that Elvis really admired who influenced him, among them are Bing Crosby and Dean Martin. Yeah. He wanted to sound like Dean Martin, and you can hear it. Once, w once I read that, I made the connection. You listen to Elvis and that kind of... And you hear Bing Crosby too, the, the low bass notes and the kind of... The syrupy kind of, you know, you yeah, can that hear, sense of relaxation. You, yeah. yeah, you can hear it, but if you, I'd never make that connection on my own. He was listening to everything, and some of the influences you'd never guess in a million years. Well, I mean, he wanted to sound like Bill Kenny of the Ink Spots, and you yeah. can hear that. But when he when he recorded, that's when your heartaches begin on his acetate. He also wanted to sing like I think it was Hoppy Jones with the bass singer. So you've got him singing the you know the tenor part. Yeah. And uh, he wanted to sound like Clyde McFadder, you know, who became yeah. the, who was the lead singer with the Drifters. It had this beautiful uh, tenor. I mean, he he would have killed for something like that. He wanted to sound like Jake Hess, who was this uh, kind of almost operatic singer for the Statesman, for the Statesman right. Gospel Quartet. But what he brought to it was something that was so recognizably himself right from the beginning. And that's the thing that you know nobody. You can hear people who create a sound that's like another sound and who have a lot of success with. Right. But what you can't create is that sense of cutting through everything else. I mean, I remember Jake Hess saying to me, Jake Hess was just a great, great singer. This is the guy who was the lead singer for the Statesman. And he said, you know, Elvis would hang around when they were playing, when they were performing at these all-night singings. I, I said, well, did you remember him? Did you, did you pick him up? He said, you couldn't miss him. He was just such an amazing, I can't remember what the phrase is, but he, was, he stood out. He was such an amazing kid because he had such a drive. He had such a, and when he sang, I mean, and Jake Hess recognized this, he wasn't like the great singers. He wasn't like a Roy Hamilton, yeah. who was in fact almost an operatic singer. He sang right. You Never Walk Alone. But he communicated yeah. in a way that no other singer did. Somebody like Sam Cooke communicated in the same way. You had so many people who sounded like Sam Cooke but no one who communicated, and you, and you can't write a prescription for that. No, the, what's interesting is Elvis, as we know, it all takes off, but it's it, it, like anything else, people think it's preordained, but Elvis, uh, you know, that's all right, mama, they start touring, and he's not a great live performer, and in fact, Bill Black doesn't get enough credit, the bass player. He would mm -hmm. sometimes carry them in shows, because he could clown around and stand on the bass, and and his antics would sometimes take them through the show. It all happened pretty quickly for Elvis, but when you break it down, you feel like it could all fall apart at any moment. Well, it, it could, and yet, given Elvis's drive, the drive yeah. that you don't see at first, I mean, for somebody who Sam Phillips said was the most insecure, the most markedly insecure person he had ever run into, he said he had the insecurity of some of the black singers that he worked with, uh, that Sam worked with. Right. Um, and yet, for all of that insecurity, he was just heading in this direction. And, and what was amazing was that his records, when, uh, when it came across, I mean, when That's All Right came out, uh, the, um, you know, that thing where he says, da-da-da, dee-dee-da, you know, this became a watchword in Memphis. Not every, I mean, very few people had seen him, right. but it was the voice that communicated. When he first appeared on the Louisiana Hayride, all these kids came out from a local college, and they came out to hear somebody who had only communicated with him through the sound of his voice. Right. And when he appeared, and he appeared in the middle of all these professional uh, groups, uh, the Maddox Brothers and Rose, I mean, they had been the stars the week before, people who had the most you know, p highly polished and developed acts. And Elvis just had something that he was feeling his way towards. And if anybody wants to see it, they can watch his appearances uh, on the Dorsey Brothers shows, which started in early 56. And you can see over the course of six shows how rapidly he, his, his uh, you know, his performing style evolves. Yeah. Um, but but it, 
there was something about him that uh, you know that that was not to be denied, and even if it was crude. I feel like there was a couple of years. Obviously, there's a couple of years there when it all first explodes, and no one knows what to do with him. Meaning, obviously, the the colonel uh, knew how to bring Elvis to the heights uh, as a, as a business, mm-hmm. you know, and as uh, as a recording artist and as a movie artist, but. Everyone treats him like a gimmick. He's a gimmick to America. I remember asking my mom once, do you remember when you first saw Elvis Presley on TV? And she said, oh yes, well I was, my mother was in law school at the time. And she said, oh I just thought it was the crudest, you know, how could this, and I said, mom, it's Elvis. What do you mean, why didn't you understand that this was fantastic? And of course she didn't. A lot of people didn't. And so you have Steve Allen mocking Elvis and making him dress up in a tuxedo and sing Hound Dog to a puppy, you know. Right, right. they turn it into shtick because nobody understands that it's a real, huge, natural phenomenon is happening. So he's a gimmick for a long time, and everyone's trying to just figure out how do we, how do we use this gimmick? Well, this was at a time when vernacular culture was just absolutely scorned. I mean, when I started writing about music, one of the great thrills for me, I mean, I did, for no, you know, I did it out of nothing but enthusiasm for the music, and one of the great thrills was being able to write the name Muddy Waters in print to write Howlin' Wolf. There was nowhere, these, this, I mean, this sounds crazy, but there was no above-ground publication that was going to consider it because it was just considered sort of beneath contempt. I mean, it, you didn't even, now but, without, with Elf, I'm sorry. But why, well, I'm just curious, why, why is it that even to this day, you've changed the game a lot for Elvis and the way that he's considered, but still there's a, there's a, a condescending attitude about Elvis fans. There's a condescending attitude about Elvis that you don't find, say, with the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Do you agree with that? Well, you don't find it with Jerry Lee Lewis either, oddly enough. I mean, I, I can't really, I mean, when I started writing about Elvis, this was the only thing I was writing about that within a certain framework wasn't right. cool. I mean, you write about Muddy, you write about Wolf, you write about Jerry Lee Lewis, you write about Ridley, that Those was cool. Those are cool but, guys to write but, about. But Elvis was not when I, I mean, was not. But is it Vegas and the jumpsuit? No, it was, it, this was pre-Vegas. It was probably the, you know, it was the movies, I would say, more than yeah. anything. But, but the, thing, the only thing I'd go back to is this was a clear delineation. This, this is both a class prejudice and a regional prejudice. That, uh, because when Elvis was a regional star in the Mid-South and, and then reaching out to Texas, to Oklahoma, there was no holdback. There was no holdback about his fame. There's a film of Elvis performing in 1955 at Magnolia Gardens in Houston. It's in the afternoon, it's a beer garden, but this mm-hmm. is an afternoon show and it's all ages. You see little kids, you see yeah. middle-aged people. They are just absolutely delighted. There's no holdback, there's no shock, there's nothing. It was only when Elvis became a kind of national phenomenon, which was in the spring of 56, really when he appeared on Milton Berle, yeah. that all of a sudden all the, uh, I don't know what you call them, not the censors, but the, uh, all the people who- Snobs. Well, there's not only snobs, there are also the people, whether they're ministers or they're politicians, right who can call attention to themselves by saying, that's terrible, that's so shocking, that's awful. And th- that had never happened before. That's actually the reason that Steve Allen dressed him up in the tuxedo is because there was a huge movement to throw him off of the show, for him not to appear after the Milton Brill appearances right. uh, because he needs to be censored. The, but all, I guess all I'm saying is there was, there, was, there was and there remains, just as there remains racial prejudice to an extent that we, we, you know, we often don't recognize. There was a there was a class prejudice, you know. This is the way people will talk about rednecks, you know. Yeah. Uh, and there was also there was a regional prejudice, and it came into play only when Elvis crossed the Mason Dixon line, only when he became a national phenomenon. He comes up to New York and he starts performing for the entire country, right? And right. people have a problem with it. It's funny. The uh, uh, you touched on the movies, and it felt to me that in the 50s, everyone thought that rock and roll is a fad, so it's something that you wanted to survive, Mm -hmm. meaning you wanted a career intact after rock and roll. So if you look at late Buddy Holly before he dies, he's getting more interested in producing strings. There was a whole uh, attempt, I think, in the early 60s to say, like, rock and roll is over. Do you know what I mean? That that, that happened, but now we're cleaning it up. Or to kill it. Or to kill it and, and get more acceptable you know, let's get, um, f- you know, uh, um, what's his name from the Beach Blanket movies? You know, more accepted. Frankie Avalon. Frankie Avalon. Let's get Frankie Avalon. 
let's replace these guys who threaten us. Let's clean this up. And, the, and, and sometimes, a lot of times, the stars themselves are eager to survive and, they're, and become legitimate. Mm-hmm. There's something with Elvis where you feel after he gets back from the army, he wanted to be thought of his first appearance is with Frank Sinatra. But it's who pretty, is pretty cool appearance, though. Great appearance, <laughs> but there's this sense that now he wants to graduate to, I'm tired of being the freak show and I'm tired of being the lightning rod for everybody's anger or adulation. I'm tired of being, now I just, I, I wanna make movies in Hollywood that are good box office. I wanna be a legitimate star. Is there something, does that make sense? It, it, I, I wanna be, I wanna be, uh, I want parents to accept me. I think it's, there's partially that's true because the whole path to stardom. I mean, when you mentioned Colonel Parker before, who was a brilliant manager, right? But who uh, and a revolutionary manager who who really uh, saw the movies in, in much the way, the same way that MTV, MTV developed, where the music sold the movies, the movies sold right. the music, uh, which made sense up to a point. But for Elvis, Elvis never had confined his ambition to one thing. He wanted to be a, a, a big movie star. He, he wanted, wanted to be, to be James, James Dean. Dean. He wanted exactly. to be James Dean. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, and he also didn't want to confine himself to one type of music. Right. And one of the extraordinary things that he does when he came out, came out of the army, and I'm not an Elvis apologist, I mean, I'm willing to talk about, yeah. you know, but, but if you listen to the session, the sessions he did in the immediate aftermath of getting out of the army in, in March and April or February and March of 1960, it's, it's, the, the album that came out was called Elvis is Back, and it's such an extraordinary range of material from Reconsider Baby, which is what I wanted, which is this Lowell Fulson blues where he's yeah. playing acoustic guitar, to, you know, Solo Mio, it's now or never. Yeah. That's what he wanted to do, and he wanted to cover the entire range of things. Uh, but I think the, the movies are a very peculiar thing, and I, and I don't have the answer to it, but if you watch... If you watch the four movies that he made before he went in the army, right. you see in Love Me Tender, he'd never even been in a high school play, and you see here's a kid who comes out there, he's 21 years old, right. he's memorized the entire script, everybody's part, and he's so eager to do it, and he has no idea how to do it, and he's, but he's just totally, you know, totally yeah. into it, but it's, it's not a good performance, but the enthusiasm is there. But he's getting better and better and better in each, each of each ne- each of the next three movies, you see him engage more and more. He studies Stanislavski. Yeah. I mean, he's totally into the Stanislavski method. He wouldn't take acting lessons, but he's, he's aware of that, and his, and his performance is as much listening in the, la- in the last two movies, in King Creole and uh, Jailhouse Rock, it's as much listening as it is, you know, acting. Now, I can't for the life of me, I've got no idea what happened. I mean, his mother died, and this really- Well, that's huge. That's huge. Because it, it, he had, uh, he has this connection with his mom mm-hmm. that he doesn't have with his dad. He, uh, he had a real he had, connection He had with a real connection, what but I'm not, saying is- But he, not like with his mom. Right, right, I wasn't disparaging his connection with his dad, but mm-hmm. he's, he has this thing with his mom that's almost mystical. Mm-hmm. And his mom uh, dies, mm-hmm. and it's, at this time when he's also confronting going, he's te- terrified about going to the army because he thinks this is gonna end his career. He's convinced of it and he's, and he's in the army when his mother dies. Yeah, and he's in the, and he's in the army and he, and he falls apart. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he falls apart and then uh, you get the sense that his mom was really his, she had so much belief in him. He was so close to his mom that something happened there. It's no coincidence to me that he gets back from the army and what I've always noticed about Elvis that bothers me to this day is there's nobody who's more talented. Mm-hmm. There's nobody who's better looking. He's got, he is a rare example of the complete package. Mm-hmm. And he is at the right time. And as Roy Orbison said, he's the firstest with the mostest. Right, he's right. got it all. Yeah. And he is passive. He doesn't like the songs they give him in the movies, but he sings them. He doesn't like the movies, but he does them. Why was he so passive? You know, why did he sing the song Clambake? Why did he sing? I mean, these songs are dreadful. And you think, he was Elvis Presley. Why couldn't he stand up and say, I'm not doing this. Get me Liebert Stoller. Get me real songwriters. Let's make a real soundtrack. Well, I think one thing that happened was that the Colonel, one of the ways the Colonel bolstered Elvis's confidence, I mean, there are these letters that he wrote to both Elvis and to his father while Elvis is in Germany in the army. And they're the most extraordinary letters to bolster. I mean, Elvis is just in the depths. Everything's over. And the colonel says, look, I've got this deal. I've got that deal. When you come home, we've got $5 million worth of movies lined up. Yeah. But, to, but, to, 
but to uh, do the movies, you've got to fulfill the contract. And I think that became part of it. But the, but the big thing to me was that um, he, uh, he made a couple of serious movies. Right after he got out of the army, he made Wild in the Country, mm -hmm. uh, and he made um, Flaming Star. And they were seriously intended. Don Siegel directed Flaming mm -hmm. Star. It was uh, Elvis admired Don Siegel. I don't think Don Siegel admired Elvis, as it turned right. out. But the point is, I, I can't for the life of me say why it is that in, in neither in those movies nor any of the others did he show the flair that he had shown in those pre-army movies. And I think, he, I mean, in other words, what he did in Flaming Star and Wild in the Country is you would say your line, and then I, as Elvis, would just, I'd blurt out my line. But yeah. there was no sense that I was listening to what you no were connection. saying. There was, there was no, no connection. Out. I mean, he had, and, and I, that's a hard thing to say, but I feel like in, in many ways, and this is, I, I know it sounds simplistic, or maybe it is simplistic, his mother's death, uh, Duke Ellington had a similar crisis of uh, confidence or, you know, when his mother died. He said he didn't write a note of music, I think, either for a year or two years after his mother died. In Elvis's case, though, it was almost a matter of belief. Everything that he had imagined happening happened just like this, one after another. There was not a false note right. from the time he first made his first recording up until he went into the Army. So from 54 to 59, it's really just an unbroken... It's an unbroken, and it all happened yeah. just as he sort of saw that it would and should. And it was all for, not just for himself, but for him and his parents, for his right. family. And then his mother dies. And he spent the rest of his life trying to figure out why did this happen? What does this mean? What's my function on Earth? I mean, and, and he explored Gurdjieff. He explored all kinds of uh, New Age religions. He uh, wanted to uh, join the uh, Self-Realization Fellowship. I, I met yeah. Diamata, who was a very serious woman, you know, who, who was the head of the uh, Self-Realization Fellowship, which had started out with, with mm -hmm. autobiography of a yogi, Swami, I can't pronounce his name. But, um, uh, and Elvis wanted to be a monk. This was, you know, he was serious enough about that, but I mean, he was in total pursuit of the, of the answer, which of course is always a bad idea since, you know, you're unlikely to find the answer. But oh, I, 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 I have, but I'll, I'll will uh, you tell me, when are you going to tell me? After we're done. <laughs> I'll take you to a special cave I have. <laughs> but, so he, so he, he gets back from the army, you've got this period of these movies which are increasingly dreadful, in my mm -hmm. opinion, and... And, uh, you know, I listen to Elvis every night, practically on Sirius radio. There's an Elvis channel, and mm -hmm. I love it. But then every now and then they say, now we're going to go to the movie soundtrack uh, show. And they, they play the songs from the movies. We need you fast forward. Then. And I switch the channel. I can't yeah, take yeah. it. And uh, because it's Elvis digging a ditch. It's not something he wants to be doing. He's doing his best, but... Um, Artists like Elvis who survived into the 80s got a chance to work with real and, and 90s, get a chance to, they're redeemed. They get to work with great producers who, you know, Johnny Cash gets this whole resurgence. Roy mm -hmm. Orbison gets a resurgence. They're taken seriously. They're treated appropriately as icons and heroes. And they... Their, their work is refurbished. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? There's that beautiful black and white special with Roy Orbison yeah, yeah. that everybody plays on. There's always part of me that's very sad that Elvis couldn't have lived to see how great his work was. Do you know what I mean? Uh, to, to see how, I know that he knew that he was loved and, and, and idolized, but to see that whole generation uh, come out and play with him and support him. Do you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, and let him know that his work was, that he was the king of rock and roll, which can sound like a, a carnival title, but that he was someone who was revered and that his work really meant something in the American tapestry, you know? And that I don't think he ever got that chance, I mean. Well, I think the fact is that he, the last five, four or five years of his life, he was what could be called clinically depressed. And I'm not, not, not having my, even my honorary doctorate, I, I feel a little right. reluctant to you know, give that diagnosis. But, but uh, I, I think that were he, to look, were he able to look back on, on, uh, from the vantage point of the present day, he would be enormously gratified at how seriously his music 
is taken at this point. But I think one of the things that happens, uh, and it, 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 it's because of the movies, it's because of a lot of career moves, but is you tend to miss the, miss the musical high points, the, evol the evolution of Elvis's music in any number of different directions after he got out of the army. So that when he comes out of the army, he becomes a ballad singer yeah. in a way that he had always, he, that's how he described himself when he first met Sam Phillips. Yeah. And he sings these beautiful ballads by Don Robertson, mm -hmm. by Doc Pomus and Mort Schumann. I mean, he sings in, in Viva Las Vegas, which to me is, I, I mean, I've never liked, I, well, it doesn't make any difference whether I like it or I don't, but the point is that I'm just not speaking as a fan. Yeah. But he does this song, I Need Somebody to, leave on, uh, to Lean On, a Doc Pomus and Mort Schumann song, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Then, one of the things that happened, and one of the worst aspects of the movie uh, experience, was between 64 and mid-66, he never went in the recording studio except to record the movie songs. Now, the reason was not because the movies were killing him. The reason was because the, what he was, wanted to do every waking moment, morning, noon, and night, was to study his religious texts. Yeah. And that's what he did. The colonel, who had no real input into Elvis's creative life, I mean, he suggested one song, um, um, you know, I, I'm standing here, the stage is bare. Um, oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that was the only song. It was a G. Are you lonesome tonight? Are you lonesome tonight? Which Gene Austin, whom the Colonel had had a lot to do with, had once had sung in his yeah. career. The Colonel realizes that they're that they're falling down on their contractual obligations to RCA. That, uh, right. and the Colonel comes up with the idea of Elvis recording a gospel album, which was always close to. That's what brought him back into the studio. He recorded "How Great Thou Art," and that's what brought him while he was recording that. He's doing all these other songs, like Down in the Alley. I mean, it, it would, he just would go from one to the other. That essentially would began his regeneration in music, which led to... 68 comeback 60, special. 68 special, and to his recording in Memphis in 69 with Chips Moman, which was the one time after working at Sun that he worked with a producer who was really going to challenge him. And then he's got, I mean... Suspicious Minds, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he's back. He's back, and he's... There's a period of time in the late, from the comeback special into the early 70s where he really feels like he's rejuvenated. He's totally engaged. And he's engaged because yeah. the shows, the Vegas shows challenge mm -hmm. him. Uh, he's interested. And then your thought is that sometime 73, 70, 72, well, well, by 73, 72, 73, I mean, you listen to the music that he's singing, it's totally depressing. Yeah. It's an expression of the end of his marriage. It's an expression of a lot, but it's really an expression of depression. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and it never come, and and you never get that uh, engagement again. And he has nobody. He's you know he's got his Memphis Mafia, and but there's nobody can. There's nobody there to shake him and give him the bad news. There's nobody there to say you need help. There's nobody. And and the other thing I've always remembered or thought about Elvis is now we live in this culture where people are sick mm -hmm. or addicted and they get help, and it's as co it's the most common thing in the world to, for people to get together. There's, whole TV shows, and there's a whole culture of, of you need help, we need to talk to I mean, you. Intervention, interventions. Interventions, yeah. and then this is almost, this is before that's acceptable. That it's before, I mean, and not that Elvis would have had the personality to be able to confront that anyway, but you feel like this is before that culture was up and running. Is well, that right? You're, you're, you're right, but, but one of the things that, the, the odd things that happened is that all these different people his father, for instance, uh, tried to confront him. Who was paying his father's salary? Elvis. Yeah, right. Dr. Nick, who's gotten the worst rap of all, and who, as Dr. Nick himself, this was Di Elvis's doctor, Dr. Right. Nick would say, well, I was an enabler, and he was. Right. But he made a real attempt to confront Elvis. He was on Elvis's payroll, he was on his plane. Uh, Red West, uh, I mean, I'm not speaking, these are not, I mean, all these people, made an attempt in their own way, in their own imperfect way. I mean, right. as you say, there was not a culture of intervention. And the main thing was that there was nobody outside of Elvis's world who had any input with him. Right. So that, you know, uh, you know, you don't like it, there's the door. Right. And he could say that to his father. He could say it to, you know, his doctor. He could say it to the guys who worked for him. But, but there was a genuine attempt in, on many, in many ways by people who loved him to tell him the truth. 
uh, it was a complete failure. <laughs> right. But but I, but you know, you think about it. I, I'm sure you've seen this in your life. I've certainly seen it in my life. And I, you know, I've seen, I've had friends who have fallen on hard times in any number of ways, whether it, you call it, whether it's depression or it's drugs or whatever it is. And you make an attempt to intervene, and you think, well, I know what should be should be happening here. And you you you're operating within a within the context of a culture that knows what an intervention is. Sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. Right, right. So I, I, I feel like there, were, there were certainly people who were just along for the ride, but there were an awful lot of people who were sincerely concerned about Elvis Vernon. I, I mean, the, the thing that killed me the most, I think, in writing the second volume, Careless Love, was the scene where Vernon is just looking at his dead son or just, you know, and it's just, he, it's just kind of like, I mean, it used to make me, every time I'd think about it, it would make me cry, but it was just like, he's, he's, it's just, I've done everything, I, I, tr I did everything I could. I tried to protect you, I did, I mean, he, I forget what exactly it right. was that he said. And it's just devastating. And he, he was a person of limited sophistication. Yeah. Well, Careless Love is great and fantastic and extremely difficult to read. It's the, yeah, and yeah. your subtitle for it was the uh, the unmaking, mm -hmm. the unmaking of Elvis Presley, right. and that book broke my heart because uh, you know the first volume is all about the explosion and the ascent, and then the second volume is the you know um, so much of the second volume, the second half of the second volume is is uh, everything coming apart and in this slow, torturous way. And I, I've found that book very difficult to read. It's, it's, very, it's a very sad story. It was hard, it was hard to, <laughs> to write, it was, but it's like that Ford Maddox Ford, this is the saddest story, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it is. I tried to, technically it was really a challenge, because what I tried to do was to vary it. I, what I wanted to do was to create the illusion that this time it may come out different. Yeah. You know, you think you know at the end, sure. but maybe he's, maybe he's not going to die this time. Maybe it's, and so for instance, I began the book not with him in Germany utterly depressed, which is the second chapter, but with him coming back to this country, kissing the ground when he arrives in Memphis, going into the studio with just these unbelievable, you know, ambitions and aspirations yeah. and achieving them. And I tried to sustain that and then using the colonel, whom I, whom I very much liked. I mean, he was a fascinating guy. Well, that, I, I have to ask you about the colonel, yeah, because you got closer to the colonel than anybody. Oh, and I don't what know a, about that, but I... <laughs> well, uh, any, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know another writer that, that, that got that close to the colonel who didn't let people in. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your take on the man? I mean, did he, after, he lived many years after Elvis died. Um, did he ever, was he ever able to put what he and Elvis did together into perspective? The, the colonel was, you know, Elvis chose Colonel Parker. It was not the other way around. Right. He even as a as a uh, twenty year old, and for all of the loyalty that Elvis felt to Sam Phillips and to what he had done, he saw the Colonel as being the one person who could take him into other worlds, the worlds he wanted to go to. So, mm -hmm. and and it was a partnership that worked very well for many years. One of the great things about the partnership was that everybody in Hollywood, everybody everywhere they went, in the way you described the Steve Allen thing. Yeah took them as total yokels, each of them, both Colonel and Elvis. And the two of them played their roles. It was, it was they were like Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside in a certain sense, but, and just chortled. I mean, they, and took, took these guys who were taking them for rubes for everything that they had. I mean, Hal yeah. Wallace, I mean, I found all this correspondence from Hal Wallace who produced many of, who was the first person to sign Elvis right. to a movie contract and produced many of his films. He was ready to just tear his hair out, to kill himself over the ways over and over again in which he got taken contractually yeah. by somebody he felt so superior to. But the thing with the colonel was that he, he was a, the wonderful thing about, I, I mean, he loved Elvis, I mean, in his own way, but, but it was in his own way. But the wonderful thing about whatever interaction I had with him, it was like playing chess, and it was like playing chess with a master who, whatever move you, you chose, you, you knew he was about seven steps ahead of you. Yeah. And my, my initial contact with him uh, after first meeting him was a correspondence that went on for about a year and a half. And I mean, I heard back from him immediately, friend Peter, 
your friend, Colonel. Mm -hmm. And it would be like, I would try to approach things in the most circuitous manner, trying to get answers. And he, and he would just send me back something. I remember one letter he wrote, I feel sorry for you, Peter. I didn't know you were writing a book about Elvis. This is after we've been going around for, he said, I feel sorry for you. That's really the worst. I sent him a draft for a thing. You know, the, that's the worst piece of historical inaccuracy I've ever seen, you know. I don't think you should publish it if you can't confirm that every element of his truth. So I said, you know, I wrote, I write back to him. I say, Colonel, you're absolutely right. I said, you know, but the thing is, how is anyone ever going to know the truth if you don't say what? And then he, he just volleys that right back at me, you know. So, but but in, over the course of, of several years, while denying that he would, that he would or could help, because he said, I'm not a dirt farmer. And I said, well, me neither. You know, we're not, I'm not looking for dirt. But, you know, it would be, uh, but he helped me in, immeasurably and provided all kinds of insights and answers. But they're all sort of su subtext. But as far as his relationship with Elvis went, the, 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 the peculiar thing is nobody, nobody knew what went on in that relationship with the exception of Elvis and the colonel. Nobody else was in on the meetings. And the people who were, who uh, I think uh, really formed the um, portrait of the colonel that has become, you know, the standard portrait. Yeah are generally speaking, and they're the ones who also formed the portrait of Elvis's father, Vernon. You know, uh, you know it's like in the uh, Tony Joe White song, claimed he had a bad back. I oh, mean, yeah. It's without her... Pokes out any. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But they, these were the guys who worked for Elvis, who are totally different. I mean, Jerry Schilling is nothing like Red West. Uh, Red West is nothing like Larry Geller. I mean, so Joe Esposito, it, all these guys. Yeah, yeah, all of these guys are very different. So, I mean, I'm not tiring them with the same brush, but the one thing that I would say is that both Colonel and Vernon saw them essentially as freeloaders, whether rightly or wrongly. I mean, I, I think it's mm -hmm. in many cases wrongly. And they did everything in their power to get Elvis to cut these guys loose. And it's not at all surprising that the guys who worked for Elvis should have a less than altogether positive view of Elvis and Colonel. And also, if you're around a scene like this, you never want to say, well, I have no idea what went on <laughs> in that meeting, despite the fact that it's a closed door meeting. So you think that they have turned, they, a lot of people who don't really understand the Colonel have, have more or less painted him in an unflattering light. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they'll, they'll, paint, they'll, they'll paint a picture of all the business dealings, and yeah. in, they may hit on the truth. I mean, in some cases, particularly right. towards the end, I, I would say at the very end, when Colonel saw, uh, El, Elvis fired, fired Colonel in 1973 because Colonel said, you can't act like that on stage. I mean, Elvis was on stage, he was completely stoned, he's denouncing the Hiltons, Baron Hilton, yeah. and, and Colonel told him, quite rightly, you can't do that, and Elvis said, you're fired. And then they went back and forth for about, I forget how long it was, two weeks, three weeks, something, maybe maybe not that long. And the colonel said, okay, fine, I'm, I'm walking, but you owe me $2 million. I mean, which Elvis did. Anyway, from that point on, I would say, you know, Colonel's business practices were somewhat uh, questionable in the sense that I think he saw this, is, this could come to an end at any minute. The and end is he, coming, yeah. And he took advantage of it. But, but, uh, but, but the main thing was that the deals that they made, they, they were essentially, uh, what do you call it? It's not a partnership, but it's, it's a shared enterprise. It's a, and, and basically, at a certain point, Colonel had no other clients, and I think it was around 65, 66. The deal that they made was as a 50-50 shared enterprise, for, not for everything, but for, for much of what they were doing. And, that's right. not, and that, many people might say, well, that's terrible, and maybe it is, but, but, it, but it was, it was a, an above-board kind of an agreement, yeah. Yeah. and you can understand why it would exist. But, but, it was, but basically, everybody... I, I, what turned me around was... Uh, meeting Colonel was really interesting, but what really turned me around, and turned me around as far as Vernon went, too, was getting into the, uh, the archives... Uh, at Graceland. I mean, both the Colonel's archives, which are just unbelievably extensive, and also the Elvis archives, which are mainly up on the grounds. And seeing the correspondence surrounding so many of the deals, the contracts, the correspondence. I mean, I, I, want, to, I want to put out a book of Colonel's correspondence, because I think it would give people a... T it would just be... I mean, I would annotate it. How on top of everything he is. Oh, it, yeah, and also how funny he is, and yeah. how clever he is, and how... Again, I'm not trying to... Because he gets dismissed a lot as, because he, as the guy who Elvis is doing a massive show at the biggest hotel in Vegas, and the colonel's in the lobby 
selling badges and, and, right, and right. ribbons, which, and I've seen the footage and it's, you think that's not, that's not what the manager's supposed to be doing. Uh, that's, uh, but he was probably doing it just as much for effect as anything else. Yeah, he, he was amusing himself. Yeah, he was happy to sell some balloons. Right, um, right, and, right. And, and acting like it was a carnival ride that people were coming to see. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, he was a man of, of many contradictions and he was not somebody who was ever gonna reveal his innermost self, either yeah. emotionally or, I mean, in a sense, Colonel's approach to things was the opposite of Elvis's approach to music in the sense that Elvis revealed a vulnerability and a sensitivity that was antithetical to the music that, you know, that to what popular music had been before him. But Colonel wasn't revealing that at all. Right. Uh, uh, but the letters are just unbelievable. You, read, you wrote a book, uh, uh, Elvis Day by Day, which, mm -hmm. I've, which I love, because it takes you literally paging through day by day what Elvis is up to. It was really fun to write. Well, it's fascinating, too, because you just see the whole arc mm -hmm. and, uh, and down to the nitty-gritty to... You know, uh, I mean, towards the end of his life, Elvis is is playing would feel to me like these podunk areas. Like he's is you know he's he's touring, and uh, you wonder like these tours seem to be taking him farther and farther away from cities. Is that true? Like it, I, I don't think so much cities. I think this was this was retracing the steps, you know, familiar steps of uh, not of his earliest career, but of of the kind of career that he that that country singers had that, right. um, but one of the things was, okay, why didn't he go to Europe? Elvis never toured Europe, and you talk about him being depressed, and this is another would've and could've. Had Elvis toured Europe in the 70s, the play, they would've lost their minds. The Europeans would've gone crazy mm -hmm. for him. Uh, they always desperately wanted Elvis to tour, and he never did. Of course, the story is that he couldn't go to Europe because the colonel uh, couldn't travel because he was uh, not an American citizen. Right, he was an illegal immigrant. He, was, yeah. he, he would come in under the DREAM Act now. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but I don't think that had anything to do with it. I mean, the colonel was working with Tom Hewlett. Uh, I mean, Jerry Weintraub often gets the credit, but Tom Hewlett was the person who was in charge of the, of the tours. Mm -hmm. And he was the person that Jerry Weintraub went into business with. He, Tom Hewlett had been in the uh, concert promotion business, starting in Seattle with Jimi Hendrix and with big national tours. They were the first of the big, of the big uh, companies. And Colonel had absolute confidence in Tom Hewlett. And Tom Hewlett could have gone. But in talking to Tom Hewlett about it, I would hear the same thing that I got by inference from the colonel, which was basically they were afraid to take him to Europe. Why? He'd get busted. Because they could control what was going on oh, in this country. He could, right. he could travel with his doctor or his doctors. He had you know, legitimate prescriptions so you're, you're, people are carrying. your theory is that Elvis did not tour Europe because they were afraid, because the colonel and his concert promoter were afraid of a drug bust. Well, yeah, because I mean that was happening. Paul McCartney's getting busted. There were a lot of busts that were going on. But I mean, I, I would leave the colonel out of it because everybody's going to say, "Oh, that's just the colonel. He's just you know just right. looking for excuses." But Tom Hewlett was just a straight-ahead guy, mm -hmm. and he had no you know uh, he would have loved to have taken. He and there was no question about. I mean, the colonel used the term, "We can't guarantee Elvis's security oh, overseas," right. and you can read that the way I think he meant it. I mean, he was never going to say it, but, but I mean, Elvis, at this point, we're talking in the 70s now. Earlier, Elvis probably could have toured Europe, but he wasn't doing that. He wasn't, he, until 1970, he didn't go on tour at all. Uh, he, he went back, to, he opened in Vegas in 69, and then in, in, in 70, he did a brief tour, and in 71, he really started touring. But I think that that was, that was what circumscribed his, uh, I mean, there was a genuine concern, and most of the people around Elvis, forget about the colonel, if you think that he has a vested interest right. in it. Uh, Tom Hewlett, uh, nobody knows who Tom Hewlett is, but many of the people around Elvis were aware that this would be taking a risk that, uh, uh, because Elvis just wasn't from, certainly from 72 on, he just was not in control of what he was doing. And it wasn't that he was joyriding. He was taking, you know, he was taking depressants. He was taking downers almost exclusively. That's what killed him, really. I mean, it was just, uh, it impacted his digestive system. I mean, everything. Uh, so it was not, it, he was, wasn't having a great time doing this, right. but it was just adding to the, to the sense of, of depression and, of, and the one place that he seemed to get some 
joy. Although he he always he, you know he was a big movie buff and you yeah. know. Dr. Strangelove, Monty Python, he just mm -hmm. loved it. Loved Monty you know, Python. Just absolutely loved it. And we recite that yeah. in, in, in concerts, which is a bizarre, but, uh, but he loved that kind of absurd humor. Well, you know, he had, a, he had a photographic memory. So, I mean, it's like when as a kid, he memorized, uh, I mean, just without making an effort, General MacArthur's farewell address. Yeah. He was so admiring of Martin Luther King, and he could recite the I'll have a, you know, I have a dream thing. And then he could recite Monty Python, you know. At, uh, but, but really what... The, the, I mean, the peculiar thing is the tours killed him, the sameness of them, the monotony of them. On the other hand, the contact with the fans was the one thing that seemed to lift him up, even though it became increasingly difficult for him to, you know, fulfill their expectations on stage. So it was a, it was, he was caught, <laughs> to quote the song, he was caught in a trap. Yeah. And uh, uh, he, w what he needed, I mean, was he was in uh, the hospital, I think, in around 73 in, in Memphis for, uh, uh, he had a, a form of glaucoma. And he, uh, and Dr. Nick brought in two psychiatrists under the guise that they were ophthalmologists who were consulting, and Elvis immediately saw through it, and that was the end of that. So there was an attempt to get him yeah. psychiatric help. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like... It, you can't talk about Elvis without talking about race. Mm -hmm. El and, and I know that uh, you said that Sam Phillips' dream, obviously, was to record uh, you know, uh, black musicians, white musicians, but, and, and, and really bring the two together and just make music. That, yeah, was, that, was, mean, his, that was his vision. Elvis, obviously, there was controversy, there were People that initially heard him on the radio think this is a black musician. He turns out to be a white kid. Uh, there's uh, a lot of people subsequently who feel like, well, he's co-opted African-American music. The metaphor for this, the idea of cultural theft, is basically a metaphor for the very sense of racial exclusion and racial prejudice that could be uh, upheld right up to the present moment. It makes sense on some level that, uh, you know, that to resent the idea that it's through a white singer that you should, um, that, that black artists should get, you know, this recognition. What Sam Phillips saw and what, I, and what he saw from the beginning, and he recorded nothing but black artists for the first five years that he had his studio open, what he saw and what Elvis, I think, also saw was once this breakthrough was made, once people embraced the music, that the doors were going to be wide open for African American performers. And that's basically what happened. You had artists like Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Fats Domino, who up until two or three years before would have been confined to an exclusive, what was called then the race market, right. they were to an exclusively black audience. They would have been big R&B stars. They never would have gotten beyond that. They became superstars. And you can say, oh, isn't it terrible that, you know, uh, uh, Pat Boone recorded, uh, I forget what he recorded, Tutti Frutti or something? Yeah, uh, I, uh, just uh, horrific. But, but, <laughs> but, the, he, but, yeah, but he, the point is, if we were to go around this room or yeah. go around the world and say, Who, whose version do you remember? Right. Nobody remembers Pat Boone's version. And, right. as, and as Little Richard said on numerous occasions, that, thank God for Elvis Presley, he could have said thank God for Pat Boone, because he had a, a co-write on the song and probably the most money that he made at that time was, I mean, this is the, the music business is based on ownership. It's yeah. not based on the record that's put out there. Right. And particularly for... It's mailbox it, money. Yeah. And, and, and so, but, but the main thing, and the, by far the most thing is rock and roll. I mean, rock and roll is just a, it's a marketing term. I mean, you, you, there are, it's a basically, it's, fo it's, a, it's a variety of folk music that are, are sort of put together under this term. That, that became a way to sell the music. Right. Uh, but, but the point is that rock and roll just broke the racial barriers wide open. I mean, after that, there was no, and, and there never has been. Uh, it's, this is, it wasn't the death of prejudice. It wasn't, the, I'm not saying that. But, but the point is the segregated markets were just forever just busted wide open. And that was basically what Sam Phillips, that was his point, that was his goal, and that's what I think, you know, he achieved and what Elvis achieved. So uh, I, I know your other uh, book that we mentioned in the intro, uh, Dream Boogie, mm -hmm. Sam Cooke. There's no, you don't think there's a Sam Cooke unless there's an Elvis Presley making that possible. I know he's a gospel singer who then breaks into the, the pop world, 
with You Send Me, and then he has this remarkable run in the late 50s and early 60s. But is Sam Cooke, I mean, is uh, Sam Cooke someone who you think falls in that category of someone who was helped by that? Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, Sam Cooke wanted to, like Elvis, wanted to reach the widest audience possible. He didn't want in any way to be confined right. by one genre, one type of audience, you know, one class, one race. And that, that you know, I mean, the peculiar thing with Sam Cooke is what, what busted the market wide open in addition to the segregated market was Ray Charles's I Got a Woman, which came out at the end of 1954. And after a lot of inspirational music prior to that, I mean, music like Shake a Hand by Faye Adams mm -hmm. or, or Roy Hamilton's You'll Never Walk Alone, which is you know a, a Rodgers and Hammerstein song from Carousel, I think. But it's this ins inspirational music. Solomon Burke started out with that. But Ray Charles with I Got a Woman, for the first time, translated directly a, uh, a, a, a gospel song uh, uh, called, um, well, it was a gospel song uh, by the Southern Tones. Uh, it was based on Ananias and translated it directly, just assigned secular uh, lyrics to it. And with that, once that happened, everybody went for the gospel sound. Little Walter did My Babe as a takeoff on uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp's This Train. Little Richard was, was signed up by specialty for the same reason. And so Sam, this, in a sense, along with what Elvis did, was, was the impetus for somebody like Sam Cooke to cross over. And the thing that scared the hell out of him was what if he didn't make it? Yeah, he was this gospel star. Yeah. He leaves to do this, so his first record he does under a different name. Right, as, under, as Dale Cook. And yeah. he was terrified yeah. that if he didn't make it, he couldn't cross back. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but you know, that, that, was, that was his great fear. But his second record, or maybe it was his third, I mean, after making that uh, lovable, I think, uh, as mm -hmm. Dale Cook, he made You Send Me less than a year later, and, uh, and it was a number, a number one pop hit. He now, also is unusual. He writes the music. Mm -hmm. He owns the music. Mm -hmm. He owns the publishing. Yeah, and and then and then he started his own record company. Started his own record company, yeah. and he's, and you know, he's an African American singer, late fifties, early sixties. Who's doing that? That was that was extraordinary. That yeah. he had the foresight to do that. He was. People say he was Barry Gordy before Barry Gordy. Well, in a way, I mean, it, or he was a different kind of Barry Gordy because Barry Gordy wasn't the artist, too. But he, uh, no, he had the good fortune. I mean, Sam Cooke was, was just the most visionary. I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think you could run into anyone more brilliant than Sam Cooke. He had an analytic cast of mind that was just extraordinary. He was an intellectual in many ways. Read constantly. Yeah, read constantly. I mean, it was just one of the great stories that I ran into was talking to Aretha Franklin, who just was, I mean, she would tell you today, that she was, you know, just in love with Sam Cooke. She loved all the Cook boys, but Sam Cooke was, and she went, her, her, first, her first pop tour, she went out with Sam Cooke. Mm -hmm. And he was reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shirer. Yeah. And, uh, and Aretha said, I went right out and I bought The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shirer. To this day, I don't, she would tell you, she hadn't read a page of it, but she just wanted so much to emulate Sam Cooke. I mean, that it was, uh, but he, uh, yeah, no, no, he, he had a vision just, of it, it was like Elvis's in a way, except it, I think it was more uh, intellectually based than, than Elvis's. Yeah. And he just had a vision of reaching everybody. Well, I've watched a lot of uh, Sam Cooke on talk shows. Uh, there's a lot of footage of Sam right. giving interviews, and so quick, mm -hmm. so funny, and so sharp, and uh, and witty, and. Really, it's just a spectacular personality and incre like this incredibly good-looking natural performer with a great, that amazing voice. Did you ever see them where, where he and Muhammad Ali are on that British boxing commentator yeah. show? Yeah. And he wrote a song for Muhammad Ali. They, wrote a, uh, they did a song together. Right. He, he wrote the song and he produced it. It's, it's like Hail, Hail, the gang's all yeah, here. And yeah. uh, I forget what it's actually called, but that's but what it is. They're doing it for, a, they, they perform it together. And it's really uh, impromptu. Right. It's, it's really sweet. It's yeah, really nice. Yeah. But um, Sam Cooke is another one of those, had he lived, you, you have a lot of question stories. I think he, he dies in, I think, December of 64 mm -hmm. in that crazily insane circumstances that mm -hmm. to this day nobody really understands. There's a lot of what else could he have done, what would he have done. Yeah, no, I mean, with, we, I, mean I, I often think with, with Elvis, 
what would he have done if he had lived? I mean, I, I'd like to think, were he to get well, you know, I, I'd like to think he would have gone back to gospel music and he would yeah. have found it enormously satisfying. With Sam Cooke, I feel like he would have had some kind of public role. I mean, at, at least that's how I Because he's becoming it. very interested in the civil rights mm -hmm. movement and wrote and recorded, change is gonna come and, you know, that was huge. That was, well, that yeah, was a big change for, that was a big change for, he wasn't recording that kind of music, so. Well, nobody was, yeah, yeah. no, it was a huge thing. And I mean, what, what's, uh, what's really interesting about a change is gonna come, I mean, it would imme almost immediately became an anthem or the anthem, the anthem for yeah. the civil rights movement. But Sam almost never performed it in public. Now, you could say one of the reasons was that he didn't have the orchestration and he wasn't gonna, but, but in another way, the song, in part, I think the song scared him for any for a number of reasons, including the explicitness of its message. Yeah. So he performed it, the only time, uh, well, I think he, did, he performed it maybe once or twice more, but the one, uh, the one main, main time he did was right after he recorded it, he performed it on The Tonight Show. Yeah, that's and the, right. And the tape was lost. <laughs> well, they, unfor unfortunately, a lot of the uh, New York Tonight Shows uh, with Johnny Carson were lost. Mm -hmm. And so there's all those great performances that are gone, which is tragic, but... Uh, yeah, it was, uh, there's, that, there's that sense with Sam Cooke and with Elvis where you, you can waste too much time doing this, but with both those artists, I, I spend time obviously wishing there was a different outcome. But, but uh, you know, I think about this a lot with, with Elvis specifically is wishing that, or hoping that he could have, been well enough to live longer and see, you know, how respected he is by people like you, by intellectuals, by people, by historians, how he's, you know, yeah, achieved that status rather than just the, the uh, truck driver who, the, the fable that he played a lot in his movies, the country, right, the country right. boy who hits a gold mine and it's all a fairy tale, you know. No, I think from Elvis's point of view, I mean, you know, and, and certainly from mine, I mean, that he was, he, from the very beginning, he was a conscious creative artist. He had a vision of what he wanted to achieve, and he set out to achieve it, and his, and his aspirations remained constant, I mean, to constantly grow. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that the fable tends to overlook. I mean, it's like the fable of the natural in, you know, in, in sports. I mean, and so often you'll see people of great talent. I mean, uh, generally it's, you know, uh, African-American, but I mean, it could be Larry Bird too. Yeah. And you, you see people dismissed as somehow or other they had this gift and that's what it was. But that no. isn't, what, but it's never what it is. I always say talent is overrated. Talent doesn't interest me nearly as much as perseverance, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's, it's that drive you talk about with, with Elvis that gets lost in the shuffle a lot, which is he was, um, talk about his legs moving when he performed, which was so controversial when he first mm -hmm. started doing it. People thought it was sexually suggestive. He just couldn't stop his leg from moving. Right. And you read those great stories about him driving with the band all night to get to a gig. He couldn't go back to sleep. Right. He couldn't sleep, and that was a lifelong problem. Insomnia. Right, right. And which he self-medicated for, which, you know, Cost, uh, you know, probably started a lot of the, the problems with medication. Mm -hmm. He was so, he was just burned out at the, by the age of 42. He had just burned himself up. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was, yeah, and, and he was, uh, and yet you feel that somehow or other there were things, if, if you listen to a song, uh, it, it was a song that the Judds recorded uh, for the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, you listen to a song like that that he did towards the end of his life, and mm -hmm. you still, you hear that same gospel infusion, you hear that same sense of, yeah. I mean, you don't hear it often in, in, in the late songs, but there you see him just sinking his teeth into it and putting the same kind of feeling into it that he does into it, and, and, that, and that's what you look for. It's, it's, that, it's basically that, that, that's what is so extraordinary about his music, about the music of someone like Howlin' Wolf, and this, is, this was, you know, about Sam Cooke is that they had something essential to convey, they had something unique to convey, and that whatever else they were going through, even at his worst moments, you can see Elvis, uh, there's a moment where um, 
I, can, I can't remember what the song is now, where he's at the piano in one of the very late performances. And oh, is this where he, someone's holding the microphone? Yes, for him? Charlie Hodge is holding. Yeah, the microphone. yeah, I know that. I know the performance. I'm trying to think of the song, but I know that he's at the piano and there's not even a mic stand. Right. So Charlie right. Hodge, I think, is Hodge right, is like right. holding the microphone for him. I feel like it's a Roy Hamilton song, but it, but the point is, he's just and I don't even think it's it's not even that his vocal is that it it it's not what it might once have been, but he is doing everything, everything in his power to put that song across. He's yeah. so invested in that song. And that, that's all I'm saying is that's what, that's what carried him from the start and it's what carried you know, him and, and any other great artist to the, to the finish. And it's, it, it was Sam, Sam Phillips' point about him, about Wolf, about Charlie Rich, about Jerry Lee Lewis was not that they were, uh, that they, that they were geniuses. And, you know, that there was no, it wasn't a question of they just fell into it. They didn't just fall into it. They made it happen because of the, the depth of their commitment, because of, the extent, because of what they put into it, because of the emotion that they just put into, if not every song, you know, every great song that they ever did. And that's just not, that's not a given with every performer who comes right, along. Right, right. It was not a, this is a career choice. Mm -hmm. They that's weren't right, choosing yeah. a career. This was a religious calling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who's your next obsession? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm... I finished a uh, complete draft of the Sam Phillips just before Christmas, and so I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just really anxious to finish that up. I and mean, then after that, it's Vanilla Ice. Uh, you know, yeah, I'd say Vanilla <laughs> Ice was probably uh, <laughs> started out young with dreams and changed the world. I'm just looking for the next challenge. <laughs> That's a challenge. Hey, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. That is it for this edition of Serious Jibber Jabber. To see more episodes, go to teamcoco.com slash serious. We'll also find a link to petergoralnik.com, which features lots of really cool video clips and essays about some of his favorite musicians. <laughs>